Hunting, warlike festivals, and martial sports. How the people of medieval Central Europe prepared for war, and why it's so different from training in the late classical and early modern eras. My name is John Chandler. I'm a HEMA fencer from New Orleans, I'm an amateur historian. I've been involved in the historical fencing community and tournament circuit and so on uh, since about 2000. I've been doing tournaments since 2010 when the tournaments came a little later. Um, I'm kind of a history aggregator. I like to uh, go and find research and try to put it together to make sense of a whole. And I'm particularly interested in the medieval Baltic and in Central Europe more, more generally. Um, with kind of an emphasis on urban communities, uh, towns, especially free cities. This lecture is a quick overview of the medieval uh, training that they did for wartime and for personal conflict, like uh, informal duels, formal duels, judicial combat, and so on. Uh, this is just an introduction, and it's a pretty superficial overview, but it'll help you if you're interested in uh, going off on further research and hopefully provide some context for uh, where these fencing manuals fit into medieval society. Histories of the art of war often have a big gap right where the Middle Ages should be. When we try to understand how people train for war and personal conflict in the armies of the Thirty Years' War or the Wars of Justinian, we can recognize certain commonalities with today. Drill, marching, strict discipline, techniques of repetition and rote memorization, these are familiar in the boot camp of a modern army or an MMA school. But medieval society was very different and therefore a lot harder for us to understand. All too often, this means that like the fight books themselves, the very context of training in the medieval period has simply been ignored. In the fight books of the Lichtenauer and related traditions, we notice certain stylistic differences between the medieval period and the early modern. Before we can really crack the persistent mystery surrounding just where these manuals and the people who wrote them fit into the societies they came from, we need to understand what war and personal conflict meant in those societies and how they approached training more generally. Though there's a great deal of continuity, there's also sharp differences between the social structures of the late medieval and early modern eras. From 1420 to 1620, more than just fashions changed in Europe. It's not just about poofy pants. This presentation will attempt to scratch the surface of what has precisely made the medieval period so different in its pedagogy, style, and inherent assumptions related to training. We will explore how the people of the late medieval Central Europe prepare themselves collectively for war and individually for personal conflict. We'll show how this preparation differed in many ways from what we think of as military and martial arts training today and from that of the late classical and early modern eras which bookended the medieval. Finally, we'll touch upon how the differences in style in medieval versus early modern fencing manuals reflect deeper pedagogical and philosophical shifts between these time periods and the social fabric that when I was 17 years old, I joined the Army in the United States, and I was sent to a place called Fort Dix, New Jersey, where I underwent basic infantry training for 10 weeks. And what that boiled down to at that time was a process that's familiar to anyone that's ever been in the military in North America, or Europe, or Pacific Rim, or most of the industrialized world. The United States Army does not assume that you know how to do really anything at all beyond maybe reading and writing. They give you some tests in the beginning just to make sure that you can read and write and to get some idea of what you might be best at in terms of what they'll train you to do, but they don't expect you to bring anything to it beyond that, really. In fact, the first part of the process that they go through is they strip you down and do their best to eliminate everything that you think you know how to do about anything relevant to the military experience. They start from scratch and teach you how to do everything from making your bed to shining your shoes to marching, shooting, and following orders. This is the way that we understand military training to work. When people go looking for uh, medieval sources on training, one of the first things that they always find is this guy, Publius Flavius Vegetius Renatus, uh, who was uh, published a manual that was very popular in the Middle Ages, and it's one of the first things that you can find if you try looking for this, uh, for something that has to do with, with training in, in the medieval period. The big problem with uh, Veg Vegetius is that he's not a medieval source at all. He's a uh, late classical source or early uh, Byzantine source or whatever you want to, however you want to characterize it. And there's other problems too. Um, he, he actually, um, by the late medieval period anyway, he wasn't 
really that respected uh, as a military source, although the the books were popular and reprinted many times. Uh, it was also kind of a hobby of a lot of medieval writers to try to fix the obvious uh, shortcomings of this uh, of this text. Uh, Machiavelli, for example, made a, made a stab at it, so to speak. And uh, one of the things that comes up always uh, with Vegetius is this Pell that you're looking at, um, which is, uh, as far as I know, this is the only source we have for using a Pell. And it's, um, it's possibly a little bit dubious because that's really what we uh, tend to seem to assume training boil down to. You just beat on this uh, pole for a while and then after a few weeks you're a genius fencer and you're ready to win long point. Um, we know that it really doesn't work that way. Um, but when we look at classical training more broadly uh, in terms of um, military training, we do see basically what we would recognize from the way we do training today. The, the, the experience that I had at Fort Dix um, was kind of a milder version of what we read about in a lot of, um, a lot of, the, a lot of other military manuals um, from the classical era and a lot of the other various sources, letters, uh, little excerpts of other books and stuff that are dealing with other matters. Um, it seems to hint at a type of training that, that's similar to what we're used to, which is that uh, they, they they come up with a single way to do everything, and they they train a lot of the uh, at least at least the regular soldiers, um, kind of from the ground up, and through uh, rote memorization and repetition, and uh, in a very authoritarian sort of top-down structure. Now, the, uh, Roman auxiliaries would bring their skills to uh, the battlefield with them, and it was understood that these people that came from other cultures, you know, knew how to do things like fight as cavalry or or uh, shoot bows that maybe the Romans were not as good at. But we do see uh, for the Greeks and the Romans and so on that it's, it seems to be sort of a, a familiar process. By the late classical period in what we would call uh, the beginning of the Byzantine era, we start to have arguably more sophisticated sources on uh, military organization in general, uh, such as the Strategic Con of Emperor Maurice. Um, these uh, manuals get, show us a uh, type of warfare and a type of military organization that is very familiar to us, partially because uh, texts like the Strategicon are part of the basis of the um, modern reorganization of uh, military structures that we that we uh, are living with today. Um, the, to the extent that they get into training, the training is once again familiar in that it boils down to uh, drill and rote memorization and um, you know there's a certain way to hold a shield there's a certain way to uh, uh, you know chase down enemy cavalry there's a certain way to to uh, throw your spears a certain way to shoot your bows etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, they they did they did work out complex and sophisticated solutions to a lot of different kinds of problems but they expected you to do uh, to fight in the in the manner that their military wanted you to fight so it's it's fairly familiar to us. It's not, again, not that different from uh, what I would have experienced as a kid in Fort Dix, except with, you know, obviously different kinds of equipment and so forth. So once we get past the medieval period, shooting ahead from the classical all the way through to the 16th century, when the beginning of what we call the early modern era, we once again can find some training materials that we can recognize as uh, being what we would call training today, where they take uh, a task like shooting a heavy musket, what you see here on the left, or handling a pike um, f uh, in different kind of circumstances, and break it down into each component step, exactly the same way that they teach you how to field strip a uh, M4 rifle in the Army today, or how to brush your teeth, or how to shine your boots. They, they tell you how to do it the Army way. And um, th so this is certainly uh, recognizable to us. Uh, we also know, however, that these troops were not as capable as troops um, doing a lot of the same tasks in the medieval era, which is very interesting. Uh, the uh, pikemen, for example, in the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century uh, were typically parked next to uh, cannons or VIPs or a banner, uh, which they were meant to protect and they really wouldn't get engaged in many battles until they were attacked or uh, maybe toward the end of the battle when things were breaking up either in their favor or against it. 
So, uh, and this was because they, they simply weren't trusted to move out into the into the fray and maintain their unit cohesion because they weren't they weren't trained well enough. Um, and we'll get more into that in a second. And you can see this continuing trend all the way up into World War One and and in the modern era. And we can recognize it in this simplified but still pretty cool and fun saber manuals from the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. Once you get to the medieval period, however, it becomes a lot harder to recognize anything that we would consider normal military training or normal military organization in many respects. The assumption in the Middle Ages seems to be that if you showed up with weapons and armor or if you had military kit, that you knew how to use it. And in many cases, that did seem to be the case. Certainly, uh, that was a lot of the medieval armies were made up of mercenaries, and when they put out the call for... Uh, mercenaries to show up, they, they, men that showed up with arms and armor often did seem to know how to use them. And even in the militias, the assumption was that uh, you would, the requirement was that you had to have armor and weapons. And they didn't really specify much about, about training or how the training needed to be done. They did not uh, go about in a systematic way to to train their armies in ways that we would uh, recognize because we don't really see, for example, pike drill. Even though armies that were using pikes in this year, which was kind of the second, um, rev the revival of the use of pikes, were extremely dynamic, more so than they were in the uh, early modern period. Um, the, the Swiss, for example, would, would show up uh, on a battlefield and make instant decisions as to how to deploy, and they would split into pincher movements and uh, attack without almost any preparation and often carry the day that way, uh, particularly when they were fighting in, in Switzerland on their, or in the, near Switzerland uh, for their own purposes as opposed to fighting a, as mercenaries. Um, so we don't, we don't really understand yet how, how they train in this period, and... Um, what training consisted of, and that's something that I'm going to try to explore a little further. So to kind of review the three types of armies that we've been referring to, um, classical armies could get could get quite large. They uh, the Roman Empire had an army, you know, that would be comparable in at least in size in terms of manpower to an army of a fairly significant country today, um, and in, they would field a lot of troops in in a single battle. In many cases, they would fight these pitched battles quite often. Um, they had uh, good equipment, relatively simple. They fought under strict discipline. Um, they fought in a somewhat predictable way, but it was a sophisticated way that worked very well in, in the field. Um, they had significant engineering capabilities. The uh, Roman legion could build a fort. They could even build a small city. They could build bridges. They could do all sorts of uh, siege warfare. Um, in the early modern era, you had also very large armies um, that were a, a little more, if anything, more uh, standardized in some cases than the Romans were. Uh, their armor was relatively light. They did use armor, but it wasn't as pervasive uh, as, as in the Roman era. And um, they had very good weapons, obviously. They had muskets and so on. And they were typically fighting under fairly strict discipline. Um, they weren't necessarily uh, that well trained. There was a lot more cannon fodder. There were, of course, very well-trained troops, experts, mercenaries, uh, some, of the, some of the aristocratic families. Um, you know, they were starting to create uh, military science at that time. But you also had a lot of cannon fodder. Um, and medieval armies were quite small. Uh, even a significant battle in the Middle Ages, uh, particularly in the late Middle medieval period, might only involve a few thousand troops. Um, they were very well equipped. They tended to be extremely resourceful. Um, even quite small armies had, I would argue, even more engineering capability than a Roman unit would of the equivalent size or even larger. Um, they would include in their ranks all kinds of specialists like the Swiss used to bring, uh, you know, special carpenters that could repair pikes and halberds and then other guys that, were, that could fix the armor and guys that could work with the gunpowder weapons and so forth. Um, they were really good at siege warfare, at c both at creating fortifications and breaching them, to, and also did engineering feats like crossing bridges and so forth, just like a Roman legion would. Um, they, had, they had excellent equipment, 
they they seem to be quite effective in in battle, but they could be really hard to control. They could be it'd be hard for, sometimes for them to get along with one another. Um, quite often, when a international army was thrown together, uh, and they often were international and from many different states, sometimes it didn't work out. Famously, in some of the uh, larger defeats during the Crusades and, and one of the major defeats against the Turks. Um, but when they were used to working together, they could be extremely efficient. And uh, one of the examples of that that I'll get into a little bit later is the Hungarian Black Army that was fending off the Turks. In the Middle Ages in the East, which is where we see a lot of the fencing masters uh, and where a lot of the manuals come from, they're facing a couple of really potent existential threats. One of them is the Mongols, and I wanted to compare what a Mongol army looked like compared to a medieval army. Mongol armies were really big, for one thing. Um, potentially, they could be as big as, as some of those classical armies. They didn't go away in the 13th century the way you would be led to believe by a lot of documentaries and uh, superficial histories of the Mongol uh, incursions into Europe. The Golden Horde and the Crimean Tartars remained for centuries. Um, these were steppe nomads. They were pretty hard people. They lived by herding. They conducted slave raids and they hunted for a living. And they didn't really need to go to school. Their lifestyle was their training. They had both light, medium, and heavy cavalry. Mostly horse archers, of course, but they also had lancers and other types of troops. They were multi-ethnic, uh, including Turks, Mongols, uh, people from what the Indian subcontinent, Persians, and also Europeans like Russians and other people like Mordvins that were related to the Finns. Uh, they did have strict discipline, but they were not micromanaged. They would have, uh, they were broken up into the decimal system in groups of 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, that's called a tumen. And these, the, their commanders would be sent off to take care of various problems and deal with certain uh, missions, more or less on their own initiative, certainly with a lot of flexibility. They had excellent battlefield intelligence and situational awareness. This is one of the most important things about them. Uh, they did make use of secret weapons, including uh, gunpowder weapons during the first battles in Poland and Hungary in 1241. But they never really did uh, adapt firearms in any large scale. In fact, they didn't really change how they fought. They, they did use you know, certain tricks, um, including probably some biological warfare. But they hadn't changed that much between the time of Attila the Hun all the way into the 18th century. They were not good at siege warfare, and they, they had some problems with logistics, particularly in places where horses uh, didn't have a lot to eat. Europeans that were facing them in Poland and in German polities, Hungary, uh, Bohemia, and all the uh, and Russia and all the Eastern European uh, states, they had uh, good machinery. They used crossbows, guns, cannons, and war wagons by the 14th century. Uh, they had very good armor. They were good at siege warfare, uh, increasingly good. Not so good in the initial in the early days, but better and better. They were able to adapt their heavy cavalry to deal with steppe cavalry. This was particularly true in Poland, where you eventually had those winged hussars that were so famous. Uh, and one of the things that they did in the Middle Ages, which I'm going to get back to quite a bit later in this lecture, is that they mixed light and heavy cavalry, and they mixed mounted crossbowmen with the heavy cavalry. They trained in tournaments, martial sports, as well as their sort of lifestyle stuff like hunting, raiding, and warfare. There was a lot of low-intensity warfare going on in Latinized Europe. Um, they did pretty quickly invent new troop types and fighting systems. Whenever they came out with something that seemed to work that was new, it would spread very quickly. So it wasn't like the Mongols where they still had the same exact horse archers for 2,000 years. Uh, Gradually, the Poles, the Muscovites, the Hungarians, the uh, Prussian burghers, Lithuanians, and the Cossacks very slowly started getting the upper hand over the Mongols. The Mongols were manipulated and disrupted by the Genoese to the point that the Ottomans had to make a pretty serious effort to take over the Crimea and push the Genoese out. Um, 
eventually the Ottomans came to kind of dominate uh, what was left of the organized Mongols, which was the Krim Tartars. The Ottomans were a much more serious threat for the medieval Europeans because um, they had all the steppe nomad capabilities that the Mongols had, but they also had a lot more. Um, arguably, they, they were the inheritors of the old Byzantine traditions and the Roman traditions, and they had a lot of that kind of organization. Um, they had basically three types of warriors. They had the wild uh, steppe tribesmen that were called Akinki, I probably mispronouncing that. Um, they had a feudal heavy cavalry called Sipahi, which were a lot like knights. Um, and then they had a unique type of slave infantry called Janissaries. These were similar to the Egyptian Mamluks, who were also slaves. Um, some of them were captured Europeans, some of them were from Armenia, um, from various other parts around Central Asia. They would be captured as children and then raised to be soldiers from like the age of eight. And a very brutal kind of perpetual boot camp. Um, and they were initially archers, and then eventually they became gunners, and um, they were some of the first effective um, musketeers in, in the world. The, the, the Ottomans, along with the Spanish, kind of pioneered the musket. The Ottoman armies were multi-ethnic. They were under very strict discipline, um, with a somewhat the exception of, of the, the nomads, the, the light cavalry, but the Ottoman um, authority was notoriously um, ruthless and they sort of they had this carrot and stick system where they would offer any inducement that you needed or wanted to get the job done and if you failed you're going to die and this carrot and stick system was very effective at getting problems solved they had very large armies they had uh, estimates between 80 and 100,000 men at the siege of Constantinople in 1453 um, they were innovative, and they were developing new artillery and muskets, sometimes with the direct help of European experts. Um, they had well-integrated combined arms armies, arguably. Um, they were, unlike the Mongols, they were good at engineering and siege warfare. Their castles probably, arguably, were not as good as the Latinized European ones, but they did make their own fortifications and they were pretty good at defeating fortifications. The Europeans had smaller armies also uh, facing the Ottomans. In many battles they only had eight or ten thousand men. The most uh, significant opponents of the Ottoman Empire during the medieval period, during the late medieval period, essentially 15th century, uh, were the Hungarian Black Army of uh, Janos Hunyadi and Matthias Corvinus, his son as well as uh, the Republic of Venice, which really provided the naval defenses against uh, the Ottomans. And then later on, Spain became more significant uh, of an opponent for the Ottomans as well. But in the 15th century, it was basically the Venice and the Hungarian Black Army and uh, various other mercenaries and, and, uh, and nobles throughout Hungary and uh, in, the, you know, in the Balkan areas. Um, those armies were multi-ethnic. They relied a lot on Czech mercenaries who were expert gunners as well as Germans, Italians, Swiss, Poles, and then of course Hungarians who uh, made up probably the, if not the bulk, at least at least a good half of the army. They used war wagons, uh, organ guns, light and heavy cavalry, and gunners. There's a lot of gunners in that army. Uh, it was a very expensive army. They suffered from infighting and discipline problems, particularly the, the Czechs in the army were heretics and they would often go on rampages against churches and abbeys, which aggravated all the Catholics. And the, they often, the, the Latinized forces in general did not have a central authority. So you had the, 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 hung, the Hungarian Black Army, you had the Venetians, you know, sometimes you had the Poles, you had various other Hungarian warlords, you had the Austrians. They were always fighting each other just as much and at the same time as they were fighting the Ottomans. They did have good engineering and fortifications, and the war wagons and armed river boats um, were a particularly useful innovation. The Hungarian Black Army had 360 vessels, which were fitted out for war with uh, mantlets and cannons and guns, and they helped uh, break through the Ottoman blockade at Belgrade in 1456. 
Um, the European Latinized army tended to be unpredictable and innovative and good at improvisation. So if we delve down into why these uh, late medieval armies were effective and why they had the traits that they had, um, there's a couple of uh, key points to consider. You essentially had an armed citizenry in most of Europe in the late medieval period, especially in Central Europe. Uh, even the peasants were typically armed. Um, you also had uh, specialized fighting castes. You had, the, you had the knights from a variety of different uh, social estates. You had um, the uh, militias from the towns. You had the religious fighting orders, like the Teutonic Knights, the Knights Hospitaller, who were also a significant enemy of the Ottomans. Uh, the Sword Brothers, the Livonian Knights, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you had, a, you had a, a wide variety of other factions and tribal groups and everything else under the sun that were all armed and, and knew how to fight in different and often complementary ways. Um, although the training they did wasn't as recognizable to us, it turns out that they did do a significant amount of training. We'll get into that shortly. Um, they were active in low-intensity conflicts. Princes were constantly besieging one another. There were raids across countries and across districts. Uh, towns were fighting princes. Both princes and towns were fighting robber knights, uh, trying to keep the roads open, keep the commerce flowing, and so forth. Um, there, was, there was always feuds and sieges and raids and stuff going on all throughout Central Europe, and even sometimes very close to the, to the uh, front line where they were fighting the Ottomans. They were, still, they were also fighting each other. Um, you had personal honor systems uh, where in order to maintain one's status within a given uh, estate or caste, you had to uphold your, your honor and wouldn't tolerate slights. And that contributed to military culture, again, among all estates. The, uh, of course, the most important would be the knightly estates, uh, the, the lower and middle nobility, and the, you had the, in the German-speaking areas, you had the ministerials who were actually serf knights. And um, you had the urban equivalent, the Konstaffler societies and so forth. Um, and then you had the regular militias and the, and the various peasant clans uh, and, and the noble families who would uh, take umbrage to any kind of insult to their honor and, and took that very seriously. And that's why they were constantly fighting. And then finally, you had a great deal of creativity and innovation. This was the period of the Renaissance. And there was all sorts of uh, intense cultural changes happening at a very rapid pace and a lot of technological innovation, and as is so often the case, unfortunately, with technological in innovation, weapons are right at the bleeding edge of that, and um, it was not at all unusual for brand new technology to be invented uh, right before a war was starting or a battle was about to commence. So if we look at what training actually meant for these late medieval armies, I, th I would make the argument that we can categorize them in four ways. You've got martial sports and games, which people are aware of to a certain extent uh, for the medieval period. Uh, you, everybody knows what a joust is. A lot of people know what fighting at the barriers is. But there was a lot of other types of uh, martial sports, which I'll get into more in a minute. Hunting, which was very important for all the estates, although especially for the nobility. It was associated with the nobility. It was one of the most uh, prominent noble pastimes for all the cultures, for the Mongols, for the Ottomans for the, all the Latinized Europeans and for the Greek-speaking um, Europeans. Um, the personal martial culture, which, by which I mean the uh, honor system and, and people carrying sidearms and uh, being expected to defend their honor uh, if they're insulted, uh, etc. And that's one of the reasons why there was constant feuding going on within the Latin uh, European world in particular. And the constant small-scale engagements, which I already mentioned previously. So to briefly review the, uh, the types of martial sports and games, I'm going to touch on a few of them. This is by no means all of the, all of the uh, warlike forms of play that they engaged in, but this is, this is just a, a representative example. So, of course, everybody knows about jousting. Uh, they also had a, a lot of other types of uh, warlike games that they would have in these chivalric tournaments, fighting at the barriers and, uh, and so forth. Um, I'm going to talk about a medieval horse race that still exists in Siena in Italy, which is a lot of fun and it's kind of crazy. Um, another sport called water jousting that uh, is done in the rivers of uh, France, and Germany, and some other places. Um, a shooting sport called shooting the popinjay. Organized stick fights, which sometimes would be fought between neighborhoods, most famously in uh, Venice, but it also took place in a lot of other places. 
a Florentine football game called uh, Calcio Fiorentino, which is starting to get a little bit of notoriety uh, in the modern world. Um, the sword dance, which was often as associated with a festula, uh, of which we have uh, different versions um, in Nuremberg and some survivals in places, uh, parts of the Czech Republic and in Croatia and so forth. Uh, and then I'm going to get into shooting contests, which were really important, both for crossbows and guns, and I think earlier uh, for bows as well. And then um, some residual links between certain medieval structures, military structures, and modern militaries in Norway, Estonia, and Switzerland. Military activity. So the first thing is this Palio di Siena. This is a wonderful horse race that they still do in the city of Siena. It's a reckless, wild, bareback horse race through the city streets. Uh, it's, they make kind of a track in the downtown now. It used to be just randomly through the streets. Originates back in the 14th century, uh, and around that time, uh, Siena was taken over by uh, condottieri or noble, I forget which, um, and they were sort of frozen in time in the 14th century. The city is basically a 14th century city, very well preserved, beautiful. Uh, the race was reorganized and made a little more civilized in 1590, although it still retains a lot of its medieval characteristics. Uh, there's 17 contrada, or neighborhoods, in the city, which uh, are the old uh, quarters of the town back in the medieval times, and a lot of times they would be associated with certain families, with certain crafts. You know, you'd have certain neighborhoods where you've got all your butchers and maybe one way you get your bakers and whatever. Um, they do the race twice a year. And uh, 10 of the neighborhoods get to participate in each race. And they alternate so that um, if, if a neighborhood wasn't in the first race in a year, they get to be in the second one and, and vice versa. And um, not all the horses are great horses. Some of them are better than others, and everybody knows that. That's, that's on purpose. And then there, there's a whole scheming and plotting element of the race that takes place beforehand, which is all part of the fun. Um, this is the, the main town square of Siena, and in the back you can see the, uh, this is the, the town hall here, the big tower, and you can see all the people. These are mostly locals. Even though this is a huge tourist draw, the locals are so into it that it's apparently hard to get a seat anywhere where you can actually see the race. Uh, and then you can see the horses making their way around the track. They just take a bunch of sand and throw it on the cobblestones. Um, all of the uh, teams, all the neighborhoods have their own songs that they sing, and the, and the competition is very fierce, and it's deadly serious, even though it's all a big, kind of a big joke and a lot of fun. And the race is very dangerous. It's known for people getting hurt and horses getting hurt. It's controversial for that reason, in fact, but the people in Siena do not want to get rid of the race, obviously. They love it. But this reckless, this dangerous part of the race is a big part of... Uh, the old medieval tradition and why I think it fulfills a certain social need for the town. The other interesting thing about the race that links it back to the medieval period and to the town militias is this thing called a carroccio, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Uh, that's this cart that you see on the left in the procession that cl opens and closes the race. These are carts that they used to, the Italian city-states used to lead into battle that would have the standard of the city on it, and if the cart was captured, it usually meant that the town militia had been defeated. And these were used all the way back into the uh, 12th century when it, the Italian city-states were fighting for their independence against the Holy Roman Emperor uh, successfully. And were used in battle with each other as well in the, in the later, later periods. This is a picture of a carroccio from, from the Middle Ages. You'll notice the little scythes on the wheels. That's something that's, that they apparently used to always have. It's kind of similar to a war wagon, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, it's more like for the standard. Here's the next holdover from the Middle Ages. This is a th strange sport called water jousting that they do in France, uh, Switzerland, and Germany. This picture is from France. Um, it does look a little dangerous. It is a little dangerous, I think. It's not as uh, incredibly amazing to watch videos of as the uh, horse race, but my wife wasn't as impressed with this as, as she was with the horse race, but it's still, I think it's still kind of neat. Um, basically, these guys get on the ho on the boats, they row them at each other, and then some guy on a platform in the front tries to knock his opponent off of the other boat. Um, this goes way back. This is, this is an old picture from, I think, the 9th century. Also, that's also 19th century, depicting the Middle Ages. 
This is from a map that I found. Uh, I, I just happened to notice that it's exactly this is. You can see the little platform and the little jousters on these boats right here. And um, this this sport indeed goes back all the way to the 13th century uh, in towns all over Europe, pretty much everywhere that had a river. So this is something that uh, I think a lot of HEMA people may know about. This is um, a really interesting uh, kind of sport that uh, was recently revived. That had, I think it had existed through most of the early modern period. It originates in the late medieval. It's called Calcio Fiorentino or Calcio Storico. Um, and it, it's essentially a combination of rugby and MMA. You have the, it's sort of a football game and these guys square off and, and box each other, kick each other, uh, they grapple. It, it's extremely violent. It's just fun to watch on YouTube if, you're, if you like that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of videos that you, can, that you can pull up. It's another one of these controlled wars, kind of. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's a football game, but it is extremely violent. And it's become popular again in Italy. They, it originated in Florence, but they, they play this in several Italian cities, from what I understand. And um, it's another holdover from the, from the Middle Ages. It's become kind of a big thing. Um, and uh, it, has a, it has a rather high profile. And you can see these guys obviously uh, train for it. There's a lot of guys that are in very good shape that get into, get into this, this game. But the, the prize is a calf, which is an old medieval tradition. A lot of times this would be almost a symbolic victory. Um, another thing, kind of a martial sport, very violent, uh, were the bridge fights. These were mostly associated with Venice today, but uh, and there, there's a bridge in Venice called the Ponte dei Pugni, which is linked to this. And it would be, again, a fight between neighborhoods. It's ritualized. They don't want anybody to die, but it's they definitely want some steam to be let off and some heads to be busted and people to be uh, ornery and, and um, willing, willing to get hurt to defend their honor goes all the way back to 1300. It started out apparently as a rumble and the, the city fathers sort of allowed it to evolve into um, this kind of sport. Um, and of course we got the sword dance which we know now and I can't don't have time to really get into it in a lot of detail but um, we, we, can relate, we can link this directly to the known fencing guilds and to certain fencing masters who would be these guys that you see up on top of the platforms with the fetters. Uh, fighting while everybody else is prancing around with their swords. And um, this was usually done during carnival, and um, we have a lot of images of this from Nuremberg where they documented their carnival really well. There's a lot of really amazing images of carnival from Nuremberg in general. Um, but apparently this went on all over Europe. It's mentioned all over Central Europe. I'm not certain about everywhere else, but it's mentioned in uh, all the sources I have for German towns, and including German towns in what, what's now Poland, uh, Czech, Republic, Scandinavia, and all over the place. Um, these this sword dance survived, and they uh, they they do it all over the world, or all over all over Europe still. Um, how much of it actually you know relates back to fencing anymore? It, you know, it, it's pretty tenuous now, but they still do stand the people up on the platforms. It doesn't look like they know what to do when they get up there, um, but but they uh, they still they still get up there. The next one, which is one of the really major and important type of uh, martial sports or military activities, military games, is, are the shooting contests. In Italy, they call these uh, Palio della Balestra, um, which I think just means contest of the crossbow. And in Germany, they usually call them Schützenfest, uh, although they, they went by different names. Um, this is a depiction of a Schützenfest in I think the 15th century and it's from one of the Swiss Chronicles uh, I want to say Diebold Schilling and if you notice on the right hand side here you can see some people fighting um, these shoot, shooting contests a lot of times were diplomatic uh, events they had an important diplomatic significance and this one got messed up because the Germans noticed that the Swiss money looked like cow patties and that the Swiss took offense to that because they're always being ridiculed as peasants and um, Apparently they got angry and uh, and started started fighting about it. Uh, Jörg Gassmann was telling me that this was still a source of embarrassment to his Swiss brethren. Um, the Italian version of this is still done with crossbows, and they do it in several cities all over Italy. 
and it's done pretty seriously. It is a popular tourist event, but it does it seems to be one of these things where once again they they divide it up between either neighboring villages, families or neighborhoods in the town and the competition is taken pretty seriously. They're they're very into it and it sort of uh seems to have this uh some kind of value for the for the city. In the German speaking areas, which would include a lot of uh East Central Europe and Northern Europe, places uh you know, Scandinavia, Poland, Bohemia and so on. Um, where a lot of the towns uh, were were largely German speaking, these events uh, were contests, but also big parties. And uh, they would have, in addition to the shooting contest with the crossbows and or the guns, um, usually crossbows were a little more prestigious. Uh, you'd have all sorts of other things, which you can see here, uh, like racing and weightlifting, dancing, uh, and just sort of a general generalized party. You can see people uh, in this, um, on the right side of the screen, lifting and throwing rocks. That was one of the contests that they would have. Um, you know, you'd have races for children. Sometimes they would also have prostitutes racing. And uh, these things were money makers for the town. You'd have to pay to get into the thing. It was sort of like a lottery. A lot of the money would be distributed back as prizes, but the town would also keep money. So even though they would provide a lot of food and entertainment, they would actually make money on, on these events, and they were also really important for diplomacy, as I mentioned earlier. In addition to shooting at targets downrange, as you saw in the previous slides, uh, another really popular way of, of having shooting contests in the Middle Ages all over Europe, uh, and actually beyond Europe, uh, into Central Asia, uh, North Africa, Middle East, and so on, was something called shooting the popinjay. And um, this basically meant shooting at a vertical target that was set up on top of a pole and then you would be given prizes as pieces were shot off of the target. Um, on the left you can see a depiction of some people shooting the popinjay, some burgers from Krakow from the Balthazar Behem Codex also known as the Codex Picturatus which is a survey of uh, all the craft guilds in town from 1505. And on the right, you can see um, some of the actual targets. These are from Scotland in the 17th century. They're not as nice as the medieval ones, but you get the basic idea. They'd make a, a wooden target. Usually it was a bird. Uh, Papa J means parrot. Um, so they'd have a wooden parrot uh, up, up on the pole, and you would get uh, prizes according to the size of the pieces that you were able to shoot off of it. Shooting the Papa J was also popular in Central Asia. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with... Uh, Henrik Sinkovitz, I apologize if I mispronounced that, um, with Fire and Sword series, a fantastic Polish uh, series of adventure novels set in the 17th century. That picture on the left of Cossacks shooting at a vertical target from horseback and exuberantly throwing their bows in the air in the process uh, is from, uh, you see that on the cover of one of the English translations of, of With Fire and Sword. On the right there is from another, um, from an, an Ottoman document, I believe, uh, it could be Mamluk, I'm not certain, but it's depicting uh, horse archers shooting at uh, sort of a tether ball on top of a pole, which is essentially the, the same the same thing. So this this thing of shooting the Papa Jay was a popular military or martial game in a w wide swath of the world. One of our best sources for late medieval Germany in general and for shooting contests in particular is a 19th century German cleric and historian, uh, Catholic priest, I believe, named Johannes Janssen. Um, and um, he has a really good history of the shooting festivals, which uh, Kevin Maurer from the Meyer Florida Feder Factor Guild has compiled in um, one of their uh, magazines. I recommend reading it. It's a, it's, a very, uh, it's a very good read. You can also find Johannes Janssen's history of the German people online. It's in the public domain, so you can find it in a lot of different places. Um, one of the things that he mentions is that the towns started these contests. The princes were involved in them with the towns, but they would come to the, the events that were thrown by the towns, but they also tried to hold their own. And he says they weren't not nearly as fun. Um, there was a lot more, uh, there was a lot more sort of hazing that went on and um, not as wild of a party. This is an example of a Schutzenfest in Zwickau in the late 16th century. Uh, Johannes Janssen says there was 187 crossbowmen from 39 towns and villages. I think there were also um, firearms shooting at this one too. Um, apparently three Swabian peasants 
won prizes, which was very annoying to the burghers who considered themselves better than peasants by this point. Um, and this, what you're seeing here, is not the actual shooting part of the contest, although I think I can see a Papa J stand over there on the left and the right. Uh, but this is actually uh, where you can see a lot of the other things that would go on at these events, including uh, a fest shooter. And you can see other, you can see people dancing, I think people racing probably. Um, might be some prostitutes dancing or racing there. And somebody's being thrown up in the air, like a, probably a little kid being thrown up from a tarp. And this is all very typical of these events. You can see they're very festive, uh, kind of a big wild party like a carnival or a state fair or something like that. And this is just a close-up from the previous image where you can see the festschuler going on on top. And uh, that actually, to me, looks very similar to uh, the illustrations that you see in Joachim Meyer. And then on the bottom, the, the, the dancing and or racing, whatever, whatever they're doing there. Okay, so here's some fun facts about Schützenfest in the German-speaking parts of Central Europe. Uh, according to Johannes Janssen, the first urban tournament uh, that, that he knew about that was documented in Magdeburg in 1279 of the Common Era, the first prize was a maiden. Uh, her name was Sophie. And she married the contest winner, who was a merchant from Goslar. And apparently this, this woman was a volunteer to be the prize. Janssen says that uh, this merchant paid her a substantial mourning gift, uh, which is a type of reverse dowry. Um, Magdeburg, as Janssen points out, means town of the maiden, and their coat of arms is a maiden offering a uh, wreath standing on a castle or the town gates, which you can see here on the right. Um, he mentions another tournament in 1387, which was uh, either an archery or crossbow contest, or probably both. Uh, at the same time as that was going on in Magdeburg, there was also a uh, knightly type tournament being held by the bishop on the other side of town. First prize at this shooting contest was also a maiden. Uh, Professor Anne Tlusty in her Martial Ethic of Early Modern Germany notes, however, that women were also shooters in these contests and they so frequently participated in the shooting that many of the prizes were uh, designed to be appealing to the ladies, so like jewelry and stuff like that. So we have no data on what happens if a woman wins a maiden as prize. Uh, the first prize a lot of times was sort of symbolic though. Um, in many cases it would be a horse, like a young horse or a calf or some other kind of symbolic token. If you won first place, you would probably also win many of the other prizes for a variety of different categories, uh, which were usually cash. And those, those started out pretty nice and got nicer. Uh, in 1440, uh, the, the highest cash prize was 40 gulden. Uh, it was 101 gulden in Augsburg uh, in 1470 and 110 gulden in Zurich in 1504. They also gave prizes out for the worst shooting. Uh, a lot of times this would be a piglet or a sow. There's a lot of um, mostly gentle hazing that was going on in these things. Um, the earliest of these contests, actually the very earliest were tournaments. The, t the towns would sponsor nightly tournaments, and they still continue to do that all through this, all through the medieval period. Uh, but then they started, it became more important for them to have uh, archery contests, then crossbows, which were really the most prominent or most prestigious, and then firearms. They had these sodalities or, or uh, benevolent associations that were associated with the shooting, and apparently that's where the actual training went on or whatever practice they did and um, those were usually associated with the Saint Sebastian for the archers, Saint George for the crossbowmen and Saint Barbara for firearms. Saint Barbara still to this day is uh, you'll see uh, images of Saint Barbara with artillery units in, in, in the American army today and all over Europe. Um, these events were important for diplomacy as I mentioned before. Uh, Strasbourg uh, organized two really important alliances with the Swiss Confederation um, in the 16th century and in the 15th century, uh, right, right, d either during or right after visits by Swiss contingents to shooting contests that they held. In one case, supposedly um, the Zurich contingent arrived in just 19 hours down the Rhine, uh, and to prove it, their, their porridge was still warm. Some more fun facts. Um, Many of you may have heard of this famous free imperial knight named Götz von Berlichingen. Uh, I apologize for mispronouncing that. He, he's even known, he's a popular figure even, I think, in, in 
anime or mag- manga in Japan. Um, he's this guy that had one sort of iron clockwork hand, and uh, he was involved in, in uh, an incident related to a shooting festival in Cologne, where sometimes what would happen is if you might win a contest, but then they, they make a mistake in the bureaucracy where the list of winners comes back, you're not on it. And if you've been bragging about winning or, or placing or getting some kind of prize, and then the list shows up and your name's not on it, it's very bad for your honor, which was a major problem uh, if your honor got besmirched in this era. So apparently this happened to a shooter who won a, who won a prize uh, at a shooting contest in Cologne, but was left off the list of winners and didn't get his reward. And um, this knight, Götz von Berlichingen, took up the guy's cause and declared a feud against Cologne and captured two of their merchants who he held for like two years. And this was not a lightly arrived upon decision, I would assume, because Cologne was a pretty powerful, it was I think the biggest city in Germany at that time, and um, was not at all reluctant to destroy the castles of knights that they had problems with, but Götz was a pretty tough guy. And eventually the city settled with him, and apparently Goetz um, got, I think he got 3,000 gulden, and he gave 500 to the shooter and kept the rest for himself. So, he, I mean, he wasn't a complete jerk about it. He gave the shooter some of the money. The entries to these festivals, uh, the, these tournaments, was somewhat expensive. It might, in modern currency, very roughly be anywhere from 200 to $500 or maybe as much as $1,000 to get into one of these, depending on where and when. Um, so it was pretty expensive. Of course, if you won prizes, it, it, would, it would be more than worth it. Um, the invitations would be sent out that had the actual size of the target on them, the size of what that town considered a foot. So each tower had slightly different units of measure back then. So they'd say, okay, this is what we call a foot, and it's and the target's going to be 50 of these downrange. Um, what you see on the bottom of this slide are some pictures of actual invitations. These are the same one. one um, unfortunately, they're very low res. I couldn't find higher resolution images. And I don't know what town or what contest this was from, but apparently it was both crossbow and firearm. And based on the way that firearm looks, I would say that is either very late 15th century or early 16th century. Um, they would have all the rules and everything on, on the invitation. Um, as well as the prize, which you can see on the on the image on the right, the prize the first prize in this was two oxen. Um, uh, they used to use okay, so th- there was there were a lot of uh, other other types of contests that would be part of the shooting contests, and the princes would participate along with the burghers and the peasants in all these things like the triple jump and throwing stones and all these other goofy things that were kind of fun. Um, so there was a sort of a, an equalizing effect that was going on during these uh, contests. And, and they were good for diplomacy between the towns and the princes for that reason. Um, the shooting contests used the language of chivalry uh, to describe uh, their activities. Um, when two shooters were competing with each other, they would call it tilting. Marksmen were divided into banners by their uh, you know, town of origin and their neighborhood or whatever. Uh, each round of shots was called a course, and the prizes were called ventures. The jester that you can see in one of the earlier slides uh, was there to keep the safety rules. Obviously, when you're having a, a firing range, safety is really important, and you've got to have people follow the rules, as well as all the other rules that were less life and death, but really help maintain the uh, cohesion and, and smooth function of the event. So the reason the guy's in a jester uniform, and these people were apparently freelance, and they would go from one of these events to another one uh, as a, you know, something they would do on the side from their day job. But the jester outfit was part of the, uh, part of the social convention that allowed them, for example, to take a prince. It could be the Duke of Bavaria or somebody really important, and if he walked in front of somebody's gun, he's going to get dragged off by this clown and bent over and spanked uh, with this big paddle, like everybody else. And these guys, w- 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 they had a lot of sort of ritual and formal roles. They also were required to write a poem about the event, which we have several of. There's some books that were uh, transcribed in the 19th century that have uh, six or seven um, of, the, of the stories of these events, which also include usually Festschule. That's where we get one of the um, accounts that we have of the Festschule is from one of those. It's worth tracking them down and looking, for, looking at those. I've mentioned a few times that they used to have prostitute racing, a lot of times the towns would also pay for prostitutes to entertain the crowds, uh, the, you know, whoever wanted to, won. 
They also had, on the more innocent side of the scale, they had events for children. They had a, a, a fool with a leather club that would allow anyone to try to hit him with a lance, and then he would beat you up with the club if you missed, which you always would because he was really good at dodging it. And a wild man who threw balls into his mouth, a mannequin on a horse that could be knocked over, and some other things like that. Um, there was also these triple jumps and broad jumps. They would hurl stones. They would have ring in. Uh, fencing matches, obviously, the foot races, horse races, sometimes just the horses, sometimes with a jockey. And all of these things would also have large cash prizes associated with them. Um, there was a 45 golden prize for a horse race in a shooting contest in Augsburg in 1446. Fencing masters were paid by the hosts to conduct the Festschule, uh, which was sort of a prestigious part of the event. And um, they also would give a prize for whoever could tell the best lie. Who do you know that would win that prize? Terrific. Um, these shoots and fests continued for a long time, and, I, and they were interrupted during the French Revolution period. They came back in the 19th century, and uh, is notably in Switzerland, Estonia, and Norway, I think also um, some parts of Germany. Uh, the Swiss revived this as, as an attempted uh, um, re revival of their militia concept and their army. And um, in Estonia, which I'll, I'll get back to in a minute, these guys that you see in camouflage down here are um, part of a defense league that's linked to um, shooting societies and also to a specific uh, cavalry society that became a shooting society later. I'll get to that. Uh, so the summary of the warlike sports. They often had an element of real danger to them. Even the, even the shooting did because the guns could explode. The crossbows could even apparently break and, and snap and injure people because these were like crossbows with a thousand pound draw. There's special uh, rules where they had to they had to wrap wire around the prods so that if they broke it wouldn't um, obviously the horse race or the or the brutal football game or the festschule or the fighting on the on the platforms and the sword dance is more dangerous than shooting but even the shooting was kind of dangerous. They were carried out during times of war by people who had to fight including the urban militia, knights, soldiers and princes. There were direct military links, which you'll see a little bit later in, the, in this presentation. Um, they had persistence into mar modern times, largely because of the social role, I think. The towns seemed to value this. So you notice this in, in Italy and in Switzerland, where they still do some of these. Um, but the military links also persists, or did persist. Hunting was one of the most important activities uh, socially, politically, and even physiologically in the Middle Ages. Uh, all free estates participated in hunting. It was often conducted in an extremely organized manner, almost like a war. Uh, and although it was also done in an informal manner and, and um, individually, and in, in, in not in large groups, a lot of times in both cases, hunting was done intentionally uh, in dangerous ways. They would, for example, dismount to finish off a boar with a type of sword called a sauerschwert or a boar sword or a certain type of knife, um, they would hunt bears during the spring when the males were following the females aggressively and the females were protecting their cubs and are extremely aggressive. In Poland they used to stab a bear with a spear that had a strong crossbar and then prop it on the ground supposedly and that's what wear the bear out. The bear would wear himself out trying to get at you. Um, these were really obviously dangerous ways to hunt and there were a lot of dangerous animals. There were you know, a lot more wolves then, um, in addition to all the bears, there was a type of uh, animal called an aurochs which is related to the cow but it's more like a Cape buffalo like you'd see in Africa today. Uh, that was a really ornery animal and extremely dangerous and often killed people. Game was important for the protein. Um, you know, The knightly class tried to ex give themselves exclusive access to certain game animals like stags and a lot of the more prestigious deer species and uh, there was a lot of uh, other uh, animal products like certain sinews and furs and, and, and whatnot that were only uh, really accessible through hunting and these things were uh, highly prized both for their uh, inherent value, intrinsic value and as well as uh, for the symbolic value of what it meant to have it. This uh, wonderful picture and the previous one are both uh, depictions of hunting by uh, anonymous 15th century master known as the master of the house book. He's also known as the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. And this is from uh, the house book of Schloss Wolfegg, which is uh, 
believed to be a uh, house book that was created for a patrician family in one of the Rhenish cities on the Rhine uh, sometime in probably around the 1480s. Uh, but what you see here is sort of a typical uh, example of what it would look like when the nobility went hunting. And you, you can see the various uh, animals that were used to help with the hunt, uh, including some birds of prey there, uh, and also uh, various types of hunting dogs, which were divided into a bunch of different categories. Um, and you can, you can get a sense of the, the, the social aspect of the hunt in this, in this image, and the, the way these people are dressed with their wreaths, and the woman there riding side saddle, which is, was not that widespread at this point. Uh, that would be like a um, kind of an affectation. Um, hunting was really important socially as, in, as well as in every other way. In this beautiful painting that I was unable to determine the uh, origins of, um, once again you can get a great sense of, of the hunt as a sort of organized action with a lot of different types of people involved, different types of dogs. You've got uh, probably greyhounds, you've got allants, which are uh, sort of fighting dogs that, that uh, persecute the uh, larger game animals. You've got, you've got the bloodhounds, you've got guys in boats, guys on horseback, and uh, you've got some men sitting around with halberds that are probably there to fend off dangerous animals that might get flushed out by all the beaters and everybody that's, that's chasing uh, the animals into the kill zone. And then, uh, importantly, you notice that there's some guys on cross, uh, with wielding crossbows that are on horseback. And these guys are probably very good horsemen and very good crossbowmen. And the combined skill uh, was something that was really important in the late medieval period um, in a military context as well. This is another marvelous painting. This is uh, from later on in the early modern period. I think this is in 17th century, maybe uh, late 16th. And it depicts a bunch of no nobles uh, organized in a large hunt. And again, these, uh, when they were hunting on this scale, you can see there's a lot of different species of animals. I think there's a bear that's up in the upper left corner there that's fighting with some people and dogs. And it uh, looks like some people are getting hurt. Uh, there's boar that are getting flushed out and all kinds of uh, deer and, um, other, and other animals. Uh, again, you see the various types of dogs. You see all the marksmen, the beaters, the dog handlers. Um, you can see a guy on the upper left uh, mounted with a crossbow, and in the lower right there's a uh, party, group of people, including a, a woman who's the lady elector, who was uh, given the honor of firing the first shot in the hunt. These are some details from the previous painting, and uh, on the upper left you can see another guy on horseback with a crossbow. Um, on the right you can see the uh, elector, the electress, firing her crossbow. Um, it looks like she just fired it. And in the lower left, I've not very successfully blown up uh, detail where you can see a, uh, a bear is in the process of, of mauling a dog and a person. There's a dead dog next to him, and you can see a footman that's uh, fending the bear off with a spear and another guy coming up with a lance on horseback. Um, this gives you an, an indication of the, the danger of these hunts. A lot of times they, they could go south, and it wasn't unusual for people to get uh, killed and or seriously injured. Um, women did hunt. Women of all estates hunted. Even the, the poorest peasants and serfs, they, they, do, they show up all the time in court records as they're getting in disputes over uh, hunting and fishing in, ver in various uh, marshes and forests and ponds and so on. Um, burger women f hunted and noble women, of course, hunted as well. They were very into it just as much as their husbands were, seemingly, in some cases. Um, there was a saint associated with hunting called Saint Hubertus, which was also very popular with uh, the knightly class. Uh, he had, according to the legend of Saint Hubertus or Saint Hubert, he had seen a, a cross through the antlers of, of a stag, and so that's often how, how he's depicted. And you may have ever had Jägermeister. That's uh, Jägermeister means basically game warden or hunt, or um, forest hunting master, and it was the guy who would protect the game in the forest, among other things, um, and was associated with St. Hubertus as well as this, this whole martial ethic. The reason I kept pointing out the use of crossbows um, in hunting is that it's probably not really necessary for hunting, although maybe it is. But they would hunt all sorts of animals with crossbows. They had specialized bolts for shooting birds from crossbows. 
They would hunt, you know, very dangerous animals like boars and bears and aurochs. Um, but crossbows, of course, had an extremely important battlefield role in medieval Europe, notably, especially when dealing with the steppe nomads uh, like the Mongols and with the Ottomans. And um, this became the way the mounted crossbowmen, which you can see here on the right accompanying a lancer, was the way that the lancer would be protected from horse archers because these crossbows apparently could kill horses. And the skill of shooting the crossbow, especially of lo reloading it or respanning it on horseback, was not something very easy to develop. But if you were obsessively hunting a lot, that was probably a good way to do it. These guys here down on the bottom are instantly shooting incendiary bolts that have uh, pyrotechnic uh, kind of like bombs on them, that, and they're using that to set the uh, building on fire there. Um, most of these images are from the Diebold Schilling Swiss Chronicles. I think those are from the Lucerne and Bern Chronicles. And this one on the right is a detail from the uh, Master of the House book, from the Von Wolfegg book. Um, and here you can see some more um, some more crossbows on horseback. These are from Talhofer. And then there on the bottom, you can see they're, they're shooting backward at somebody that's pursuing them. Um, it looks like a trick shot, like something Annie Oakley would do. But this maybe is... A one answer to the famous Parthian shot, which you can see this Mongol horseman is, is using. Um, they would harass their enemies, and when chased, they would shoot at their pursuers. And this was an extremely useful technique, which apparently you could also do with a crossbow. I'm not sure that was the only way to do it. Maybe that's just for close range, the way that Talhoff is pointing out. But it shows, again, um, the flexibility of the use of crossbows on horseback if you were really good at it. I think that the way they got really good at it was by hunting with them. Um, the personal martial culture part, um, I, I covered this in depth in a previous lecture, so I'm not going to get into it. But everybody that was a citizen or even a half-citizen had a role in the militia, and a lot of them joined these shooting guilds and so on. Um, I've covered those before a little bit, too. And what I want to do to kind of for the drill-down part of this lecture is uh, the medieval urban cavalry societies. This is something I haven't really gotten in deep into yet before, and I have two really good examples of that, and I'm going to get into those uh, now. So first, uh, just, to ex just to point out, on the left here you see um, what, what a merchant typically looks like in the, uh, in the genre literature. Uh, on the right is a real merchant, that's Jacob Fugger. So on TV, they're usually weak, ineffectual, often displayed as sort of like eunuchs. Um, here's another merchant. This guy is a member of the Gross Ravensburger Handels, Handels Gesellschaft, um, the Great Ravensburg Brotherhood, which was a merchant company between uh, several cities in southern Germany in, in the Middle Ages. They were really powerful uh, company in the earlier Middle Ages. Um, and then here on the sides you can see the uh, the wild man or the leshy or the wood woes or whatever you want to call them. It's basically the medieval big, Bigfoot, which kind of represents the dangers of the road, that these guys, these merchants, would travel from town to town with valuable cargo and they were faced with bandits and brigands and uh, robber knights and they were the ones that had to defend themselves, otherwise they couldn't conduct their business. And they were actually pretty tough people. Um, they cultivated a uh, culture of chivalry of a, or of a, uh, a martial culture in the medieval iconography and terminology of their day. And they used to have these clubhouses uh, where they would hang out and plot all their uh, activities. This is one of them that's called the Artist Court, which was means the King Arthur Court in a city called Turin in what's now Poland. It was then... a Middle Ages, it was mostly German city, or at least German speaking. Um, this is the one also artist called Artist Court in Gdansk. Uh, I'm sorry for mispronouncing that. Gdansk used to be called Danzig. Uh, it was a formerly mostly German city or German speaking. Um, the picture on the right is what it looks like inside. There's big uh, marble shits hanging from the ceiling because these people were merchants. And these folks in, in Gdansk were... Um, their their martial capabilities were most were mostly expressed as privateer captains and ship captains that would uh, get involved in in naval combat. So I want to talk now a little bit about two medieval cavalry societies that uh, appeared in the records for a couple of late medieval uh, and early modern cities. Um, 
In this case, uh, what we're looking at right now is a map of Riga, which currently is the capital of, of the country of Latvia. In the late medieval period, uh, Riga was a largely German-speaking settlement um, that was founded mostly from German merchants uh, from further west in Prussia and um, Lower Saxony, and from other, and as well as settlers from other places, uh, including Flanders and Holland, and, and even places like Scotland. Um, Riga was founded in the middle of the Baltic Crusades, although it wasn't specifically part of the Crusades. It was a, uh, always was a merchant trading town, and eventually also became a manufacturing center. Uh, it was resided in what was at that time the region of Livonia, which was being controlled in the late medieval period by something called the Baltic Noble Corporations. Before that, it was uh, under the direct control of a powerful crusading order called the Livonian Order. They had previously been known as the S Livonian Order of the Sword or the Sword Knights. Um, the Livonian Order, which was uh, an affiliate of the Teutonic Order, had kind of gotten their back broken by getting involved in some internal politics in Lithuania. And as a result, Livonia had become a little bit fragmented. There were several uh, powerful princes. There were prince, prince bishops that controlled the various uh, bishoprics in Livonia, and which uh, is the area that now includes um, Latvia and Estonia, as well as the Kaliningrad Oblast, which is part of Russia. That's kind of a free-floating part of Russia out in the middle over there. Um, anyway, this town was a, uh, a merchant settlement for the most part. It was part of the Hanseatic League. It was a fairly powerful community militarily. Uh, it was surrounded by a lot of really dangerous enemies, in addition to the local Baltic people, not all of whom had been fully converted, and many of whom were not that well treated by the uh, Livonian order in particular. Um, in the general region, you also had the Grand Duchy of Moscow, which was uh, nominally a vassal state of the Mongols, but was uh, fairly independent and extremely tended to be extremely aggressive. You also had the Mongol Golden Horde nearby and the Crimean Tartars or Crimean Horde, which was based further south in Ukraine, uh, but which conducted raids all the way up into this area. Um, and then meanwhile, the Teutonic Knights and Livonian Order were uh, often feuding with Poland and other neighboring powers. So it was, it was a very uh, dangerous area. There were also pirates uh, that infested the, uh, the seas and even in the rivers in, this, in these regions. And therefore, L Riga, which you can see here in this map, is quite well fortified at this time. And uh, some, of the, some of the old fortifications are still there. I recommend looking at pictures of them. They're really interesting or visiting yourself if you have the opportunity. Um, tough, fortified little town. You can see the very large churches and the cathedrals in there, which are indicative of their prosperity. Um, and uh, you get a sort of a besieged sense from this map, which... Uh, just kind of the way a lot of these medieval free cities and city-states were, but in particular in this region, uh, they, they were in a rough neighborhood. So in the city of Riga, there was a special cavalry society. Um, it's actually in both in, in Riga and another very similar free city or city-state uh, called Tallinn. Um, and in those, in those cities, there was a cavalry society made up of young uh, bachelor merchants which was, de which was called the Brotherhood of the Blackheads. And they called them that because it was dedicated to St. Maurice, who was a uh, very important late medieval saint. Um, he, was he was a medieval saint who became very important in the late medieval period in particular, uh, although he had been important for a long time. And he was the patron saint of Charlemagne, of Burgundy, of Austria, of the House of Savoy, of the Swiss Papal Guards of Sardinia, of Cutlers, and of the Holy Roman Empire. He was a very important guy. And he was always uh, portrayed as a sub-Saharan African. Um, the legend that he was associated with was that he was uh, an Egyptian of the Theban legion of the Roman uh, army and had refused to uh, massacre some Christians that were um, causing some problems in what's now Switzerland. Uh, on be and as a result, he and his men were... Uh, killed or decimated or something. They were, he was martyred. But as one of the few soldierly saints, um, like St. George, St. Michael, um, you know, St. Florian, and a few others, St. Maurice was highly venerated by all the military 
estates, especially the nobility and, and uh, all the, the kind of knightly caste. So the Brotherhood of the Blackheads, which was this cavalry society that was dedicated to St. Maurice, was founded either in Riga or Tallinn. I was not able to determine which one was first. Um, shortly after the St. George's Night Uprising of 1343. Uh, in that uprising, pagan Estonians, who were uh, local Baltic people that have a, f a language similar to Finnish, rose up against their German and Dan Danish crusader masters and slaughtered a lot of them. It was a really extremely bloody uprising or in which a lot of people were killed. Uh, neither Riga or Tallinn was especially targeted by the uprising, which was mainly aimed at the crusading orders and the f uh, feudal landlords. But they did both have to fight off uh, enemy armies, and um, it was a it was a close run thing, as they say. So everyone was rattled, and it led to uh, r revised attention toward their uh, military. Uh, the society spread to Narva, Tartu and Hapsalu in Estonia and to the city of Wismar in northern Germany. Um, the first records that we have directly from the society uh, date to 1399. The earliest documented statutes, uh, rules, internal rules of the society date to 1416. Um, the society consisted of mostly young bachelor merchants and young ship captains. Um, they preferred to include the unmarried men in these societies so that they were more expendable because they didn't have families and they were expected to fight. Um, they were among the leadership of the cavalry of the town militia. They were sort of elite corps of the, of the uh, cavalry arm in the town militia and they had many special rights. They uh, used to organize tournaments in the spring. I think initially just cavalry tournaments and then later on they also, uh, they also organized some shooting contests. Uh, only elite merchants and knights were admitted into these uh, tournaments. However, it wasn't not, uh, they were not normally open to artisans or peasants. There was a riot in Riga in 1488 during one of these tournaments after a merchant, uh, young merchant, unhorsed a Livonian knight. There was a lot of rivalry between these towns and the Crusading orders, and uh, Riga in particular went to war with the uh, Livonian order and I think the Teutonic Order on several occasions, and, and they uh, often brought in mercenaries. They even allied themselves to the Lithuanians um, when the Lithuanians were still pagan in a couple of cases. So there was a lot of tension between the, um, the Livonian Knights and the uh, uh, local burghers. The order purchased arms for, this, for the cities, and in one uh, case uh, documented in 1526, they bought eight torsion artillery pieces of some kind, uh, so catapults or mangonels or something. 20 cannons and 66 uh, smaller guns, like uh, probably pencil-mounted guns, small caliber cannons. The uh, society fought in several battles in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. Most important action uh, was a, a couple of cavalry fights, one in 1560, in which uh, town councilor was killed, and they um, helped lead the defense of in the sieges of Tallinn in 1571 and 1577 during an extremely ugly uh, sectarian war between L the Livonians and the Muscovites that was called the Livonian War. Uh, much later on uh, in the 19th and 20th century they became associated with the Estonian Defense League which is kind of a shooting society that was linked to the military. Uh, the Brotherhood of the Blackheads apparently uh, were the inventors of the Christmas tree or at least they're one of the people who claimed to be the inventors of that of it, and it was one of their ceremonies in which the tree first showed up, be decked in uh, candles, and then the tree was was burned. That was the original ritual. Um, this monument here on the left, which is now in the city itself, it was actually it was outside of the city before, is the monument to that city councilor Blasius Hochgrieve, who was a member of the Brotherhood, and on the right. Um, from 1561 is a painting called the Epitaph of the Brotherhood, which depicts uh, the portraits of all the members who were killed in battle. All those guys you see there praying to Jesus were killed. And in the background you can see Tallinn, and you can see it look, looks like some cavalrymen fighting. So this is probably what they looked like. Um, they do have poofy pants, and uh, they've got swords. It looks like long swords to me, maybe. Maybe those are arming swords or cut thrusts. I'm not sure. 
Um, so, and then finally, the last cavalry society that I'm going to get into is called the Lilienvent of Braunschweig, um, which I'm probably mispronouncing, and I apologize. Uh, I'm just going to call it Brunswick from now on because that's actually closer to the Low German name, and it's also very easy to pronounce in English. And it's what the English used to call it. It's a medium-sized Hanseatic town in northern Germany, about 15,000 people in the late 14th century. Um, it was not quite, even though it was a Hanseatic town, it was not a, a free and imperial city then uh, yet. And there was a lot of internal dissent because there was a sort of rough economic parity between the merchants and the craft artisans. So they were fighting each other a lot. Originally the merchants had all the power and the artisans were starting to revolt and, and take power back. Uh, the neighborhood was dangerous. There was a lot of robber knights in that area, um, particularly from a certain f certain infamous families. And there were also some princes that um, were ambitious and interested in taking over the towns. Um, this lion that you see here is the <clears throat> the symbol of the city that dates back uh, to a, a nobleman that was associated with its foundation in the earlier Middle Ages. And this is a 16th century map of the city where you can see the rather formidable walls and um, all the nice nice buildings inside of town, all the church stuff. Um, so this uh, this organization called the Lilienvent, which was the Cavalry Society there, was formed during a time of crisis in the city, just like just like the Brotherhood of the Blackheads and, and uh, Livonia was. Um, there was a guild uprising in, in 1374 in which eight city councilors were killed. Um, because of that, <laughs> the Hanseatic League, which did not like guild uprisings, uh, expelled the city from the League in 1375, and that meant that the city no longer had the military, political, and economic backup of the League, um, which immediately meant that robber knights started preying on the city and all their uh, dependencies to keep the commerce alive and keep the city from being destroyed. They, they formed a town league with Hanover, Lüneburg, and five other towns in 1376. Then they built a uh, a landwehr, which is sort of like a like a levee or a, um, a earthen wall and a moat around the city, uh, three to ten kilometers outside of town, uh, with with several towers that were manned by the militia. Uh, between 1376 and 1384, city councilor named Hermann von Wecheld founded the Lilienvent, the Cavalry Society, in 1384 which was originally 60 young bachelors who were armed and mounted by their families and guilds. Some of them were craft uh, artisans, some of them were merchants and patricians. The city government um, went through a, a formal reorganization in 1386 where they made a power sharing arrangement between the craft guilds and the, and the merchants and was then readmitted into the Hanseatic League. Uh, Hermann von Wecheld was elected one of the burgomeisters. It's sort of like a mayor, the burgomeister. There was, there was, there was usually three at any one time. I think he was elected as the senior burgomeister, if I remember correctly. Lilienvent um, was made up mostly of young merchants, but it also included artisans from the more prestigious guilds, including the cutlers, furriers, butchers, and goldsmiths. And uh, I think there were also beer brewers. Um, Lilienvent participated in tournaments, and they sent a team of marksmen to Magdeburg to that shooting tournament I mentioned earlier in 1387, for which the first prize was a maiden. Um, but the importance of this cavalry society, which did participate in tournaments and all these chivalric games, came uh, became clear during the Lüneburg War of Secession, which was taking place right about this time. This was a complex uh, dynastic struggle between members of uh, a princely family or a couple of princely families um, and and several towns, including Lüneburg and and and. Braunschweig or Brunswick. Um, they sided, with, the two towns sided with uh, Prince Friedrich and against Duke Magnus Torquatus and Albert of Saxe Wittenberg. Um, the princes had decided to make Brunswick and Lüneburg their residence, meaning that it was going to be their capital. And it essentially means that the uh, towns would be mediatized, meaning they would lose their freedom and independence. Um, Magnus Torquatus was actually almost captured Lüneburg, but was forced out of town uh, in a brutal street fight. Um, and not too long after that, Albert was hit by a rock from a catapult during a siege and killed. And subsequently, the, um, 
the war which had lasted 18 years was uh, ended. Um, apparently in this last battle in 1385, Hermann von Wecheld killed several knights in single combat. He was the burgermeister that had founded the Lilly Invent. Um, the towns launched a campaign against the Mandelslaw family, uh, which was a notorious group of uh, or cl noble clan of robber knights that was in the area and that would always attack the merchant caravans and successfully subdued them. Although fights with the regional gentry and uh, nobility continued into the first, I think the, into the second quarter of the 15th century. Um, there was another battle in 1535 where the Lillian Vent fielded 400 lances. Um, the city of Braunschweig was besieged by Duke William of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel in 1440, and the Lillian Vent uh, helped with the defense. The Duke was defeated. The next year after that, the Lillian Vent held a shooting contest with crossbows, uh, shooting at the Popinjay during the Feast of St. John in 1441, and then at Pentecost in 1446, they had a shooting con another shooting contest with crossbows and firearms both crossbows and firearms. By 1671, the Lillian Vent had become purely a shooting club. So, um, for this martial sports and warlike games thing, um, we can see that, uh, you know, the games were rowdy. They were participated in by groups like these cavalry societies that actually had to fight for real. Um, hunting uh, played an important role in keeping the edge on people in this period and was uh, including burghers and uh, a lot of the, even the peasantry, but also especially the knights and the nobility. Um, all this training played important social roles, which is uh, too complicated to get into right now, but we're clearly there and are still there in some certain parts of Europe where they still do some of these, some of these uh, things like the, the shooting contests in Italy and the, uh, and the race in, in Siena. Um, these activities were organized by and linked to sodalities, or uh, what we would call uh, benevolent associations, social aid and pleasure club. They were sort of the uh, social side of the guilds, which were part of the defense of the town. And they were also linked to these self-defense revivals, like in the Schutzing Fest in uh, Norway, Switzerland, and Estonia, even up to this day. It's really kind of foolish to draw too many conclusions from the data set that we do have. As you can see, it's, it's kind of a limited data set. It can't really say definitively that we truly understand what training was like in the Middle Ages, except to say that it seems to be very different from what we saw in the classical period and in the early modern period. In a nutshell, you could make the argument that at least in Italy, in Central Europe, and a lot of Northern Europe, uh, in places that are now uh, Poland and Bohemia and Sweden and Germany and Italy and Switzerland, Austria and so on. The training consisted of contests and kind of violent games and big parties. Um, the actual practice part of the training seems to have been done on an individual basis to some extent, but it may be uh, that we have a little bit more to learn about what actually went on within these um, guild sodalities or these brotherhoods, these um, benevolent associations and so on that uh, like the, the uh, Guild of St. George and the Guild of St. Sebastian and the Guild of St. Barbara and so forth. St. Michael's Guild that we have up in Bruges, uh, which uh, we have some of our current um, fencers in, the, in our modern fencing revival involved with. They were the ones that seems to have uh, had some control over whatever organized training was going on. But this, for every kind of skilled labor, training was done in a unique way in the Middle Ages and in a, in a remarkably uh, free way in a lot of respects. And this is what really makes it stand out um, as different from these other eras. You don't really have a lot of slave soldiers, for example, in... Latinized Europe, what you do have are a lot of free soldiers who are difficult to control and who you have to pay a lot to come out onto the battlefield, but who can get a lot done, who have, um, in spite of all the problems associated with them, they, they, uh, they can be quite formidable and they were able to hold off the Ottoman Empire, which was uh, much more organized and 
larger polity than any of the states within Europe or the quasi states, the failed states that you saw all over Central Europe and Italy and elsewhere. And this meant that there was something unique about the, uh, the quirky way that they did their training in the Middle Ages. And you could probably equate that to the quirky way that they trained for lots of other things, including um, the, the way that the artists learned their, their crafts that have, we've left us, the, the art of the Renaissance or the architecture from the period, or so many other things that, that stand out to this day.